let's get a feel for who's in the audience, if we could, just real quick, uh, show of hands. Who already holds either a 107 or a 333? Okay, so we've got a few people. Okay, so we've got a few, so you're flying birds already. And then, so the rest of you interested in drones and selecting drones, let's, let's figure out, are you looking from a hobbyist standpoint? Anybody hobbyist only? No, just, okay, so everybody's looking at potentially doing it commercially. Okay, good. Anybody looking for anything other than photography or filming? What kind of solution? Uh, like, uh, You're not a drone racer, are you? No. <laughs> I'm from uh, AI uh, department, like oh. so we are like, you know, uh, kind of mapping. Mapping, like, GIS like, solutions. Yeah. Sure, okay, good. Which ultimately, unless it's LIDAR, you're talking about, yeah. you know, you're going to be using it for photography purposes. Okay, good. good. I, I saw one gentleman over here. What were you guys trying to get into as well for? Oh, well, like tactical infrared, um, information for our department. Just, I guess information gathering and data collection. Now you said department. Are we talking law enforcement? No, fire. Oh, fire. Okay, good. Any other first responders? No? Okay, good. You know, part of what John and I were hoping, was that a first responder back there? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, Thanks for giving us that. And you know, part of what we wanted to do is walk through what CNN does when they're selecting a drone, and then what my imaging company does when we're selecting a drone. And then also kind of give you some, uh, some suggestions when you're looking to select your own drone. And you know, that's, that's really the intent of it. And so part of this was to try and make it a little bit more interactive. We've got a pretty small crowd here, relatively speaking, that over the next 50 minutes or so that you know we can make that a little bit more interactive as we go and we'll certainly talk about the birds that we've got up here uh, we'll talk about the one that uh, the CNN group you've been hearing about with the authorization for the flights over people uh, the waiver there that they've got for that uh, and and go from there you know when when I get asked the question what drone should I what drone should I buy? And I, I literally just got the email during the last session that we were sitting in there. Somebody sent me an email. Hey, what do you recommend? I want something that takes good videos and good pictures. And, you know, so I kind of rewind. It's, it's sort of like asking, you know, what tool should I buy for my toolbox, right? And, you know, when, uh, when you need a nail, you buy a, yeah, if you've got a, a screw that you need to turn, you pick up a, yeah, a screwdriver, right? And so it's, it's the same thing with the drone. Now, if you're just looking from a hobbyist standpoint, you know, there's, there's a lot of great low-end birds out there, and I, I brought one with me that uh, we'll talk about. But it, it, it sort of starts with, what are you looking for in terms of functionality? And that's why I was asking the question, because you know, sometimes the application will determine what equipment you need. And then if you're looking at, hey, I just want something to get into the market, then you start with that old question of, you know, what's the price range that you're looking for? You know, and what's really great is the price range has really dropped massively over the last two and a half years on this technology, and it's just it's getting more and more brilliant as we move along. Absolutely. Um, for for to, to harp on your question, you know, everybody wants to know what, what's the best job. Well, you know, or what's the best drone for the job? Well, that's uh, kind of objective, but uh, you know, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, and some of these first responder applications, there's a ton of ton of new tech that came out uh, that we'll, we'll touch base on a little later with the Matrice over there. But um, for the most part, from from A to Z, when we when we first when a mission hits my desk, we we initially look at it as as every job is a is a mission. Um, when we when we begin, first thing we do as a producer will pitch a story, or something big will come up, and I'll touch on breaking news in a minute because that's going to decide what I'm bringing with me. And, and how I'm going to get it there. Um, but if it's a document unit, or if it's a, when we're looking for high-end stuff, we, you know, we want real good 4K footage, we want to be close, we don't care about how much noise it's going to make, we don't care about um, how much range we have on it, if we're going to be flying in, in, inside of a building, if we're, uh, if we're looking for live capabilities. That's really what, what CNN is looking at when we're selecting a new platform. Um, also, we want to know reliability and safety. Obviously, like Greg said the last week, or not last week, the last presentation is we want to report the news, we don't want to be the news. Um, so when we, when we look at those aspects, obviously safety is first. Um, we want to know 
A, basically, it's safe. B, what can it do for us? If, if we're looking for 4K footage, that's what we want. All of our libraries are shifting to 4K, even though we don't broadcast in it. But um, that seems to be, you know, we have to, and that presents more problems for us when we have to actually downgrade our, our beautiful 4K footage. But that's, that's part of the, the selection process, is if, if we don't need something for 4K, then why bring a 4K platform? Um, most of the time when we do these things, if it's a document unit, we're gonna bring the best that we've got. Um, we just got the, the Matrice 210. Uh, we've got a lot of other great, the, the Inspire 2 is our bread and butter for, for platforms for as far as broadcast purposes go. Um, now that we've got the, the, the Matrice, um, you know, that, that opens up a lot of things as far as weather goes. Uh, all these things that we're gonna take into account, weather, batteries, because you know, traveling is a, a huge issue that most people forget about. If you're traveling for shoots that aren't going to be in driving distance, we got to think about what the TSA wants to do with you, how much weight you're bringing with you, what these cases are. I mean, we see that we've got these two giant cases over here that we got to haul through the airports. It's uh, it's not something you throw in the back of your you know your your Toyota or your Honda and, and drive away with. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into what we have to do. It's not just you know grab the grab the Mavic and head out. Um, and even when we do do that, there's, you know, obviously we know flight planning is involved in airspace. So we want to be able to have uh, a system that's smart enough that if we do want to expand, you know, laterally throughout the CNN, basically ranks, uh, we want to be able to ideally spend, you know, a, a drone out with every single photographer, every, every news reporter, everybody that we've got, but we want to be able to use them as easily as possible. We don't want to overwhelm somebody with, you know, a bunch of information that they're not going to need. Um, so in, in which case, you know, the, the Mavic would probably be the, the user-friendly issue. Um, if we're looking for something that I'm going to fly, you know, I can get a little bit more technical than a, a photojournalist or a reporter that's out in the field. Um, but those are, those are things that, you know, we will jump into as far as, you know, selection goes. But there's a lot that most people don't think about when we're actually selecting a platform. So you heard John say it all starts with trying to identify what the needs are. You know, and capturing all of that uh, when, you know, you get a flight or a request or if I get a call over trying to film something or, or take a shoot or anything like that, first thing is to try and capture those details. And I'm sure, how many folks are photographers already? Yeah, ground photographers. So when you get a shoot, you go through your, you know, trying to identify your shot list, right? And what the <laughs> expectations are and all of those requirements. Same things with the bird. And, you know, there's a couple of additional questions that you always ask about so you can identify, you know, is there travel required? Do I need to compensate for having these lithium batteries on an aircraft? Because it's, you know, on a commercial flight, you're limited by the number that you can actually travel with. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to travel with the suitcase of batteries that that 600 Pro takes uh, because it's over the quantity that the commercial airline is able to accept. So you think in terms of, you know, what's the travel requirement, what's the geography uh, that you're going to be dealing with, and then that helps to determine, um, you know, the, the battery necessities, uh, the power necessity, you know, are you looking to uh, recharge, you know, carrying an inverter in the car to be able to recharge, do you need a generator, a full studio suite, do you need monitors, uh, that type of ground equipment when you're, you're shooting. Uh, those are the other considerations that you'd want to take into place with that. You know, the, the payload, you know, talking about what's required in terms of the camera. There's a lot of great cameras out there now. Some of them shoot better stills. Some of them shoot better film. Uh, based upon what that project is, are you looking at a low light situation? You know, that's been one of the big challenges with the drone cameras, the smaller sensors that they have. You know, when the Phantom, are there any folks that are already flying Phantoms? And, you know, as, as you followed this, undoubtedly, you probably some of you started out maybe with the Phantom 3s, maybe some of you. Anybody <laughs> fly any of the Phantom 1 or 2s? You did. How was that in low light? Uh, it was pretty grainy, but uh, the main thing was the fish out effect with the yep. horizon, you know. You had, to, you had to either edit that out. It was sort of that GoPro effect, you know, the yeah. way that it would round out at the edges when he's talking about the fish eye. So that was one of the challenges. And then as you know, the Phantom 3 came out, the camera was much, much better. I think uh, 20 meg, is that what it shot at? 20 megapixel, 12. 12 megapixel. And then the Phantom 4, uh, the standard, which you know, DJI now no longer support, and then you're into the Phantom 4 Advanced and the Phantom 4 Pro, and now your sensor size has gone up to one inch, which really gives it a much better picture now when you're trying to shoot in low light. 
uh, and, and be able to capture some of those images uh, outside of the golden hours uh, in that situation. So that's what we're speaking of when we talk about payload. You know, is there a requirement? Um, you're mentioning infrared. You know, there's not a lot of cameras out there, or a lot of birds now that will fly out the dual cameras, but you've got one there. Yep, and they are not cheap. So if uh, you guys are looking to, to jump into that, we'll talk a little bit later a bit about price, but that's also something that we need to, to harp on. Not everybody has a, a CNN budget that they can throw at something. You know, when we, when we make a, a, a decision to move forward, you know, we're not just buying one, we're buying a fleet or we're, we're, you know, we're getting one that's really high end. You know, the, the Matrice is basically, you know, we call it the Cadillac, but you know, it's, it's, it costs about as much as, as, a, as a lightweight Cadillac. So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely those things that you want to factor in. Um, as far as where, you know, project needs, you know, will that Matrice cover your, your infrared needs? Yeah, but the, the camera itself is like 11 grand, uh, and that's just to add it to the platform. So. Those are things that you're going to have to think about. Uh, it's 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 not. Just are you already flying thermal? No. No. Yeah. So. Right. When when you start looking at, uh, you know, do you need just thermal alone? You know, there's a lot of great equipment out there. The Inspire One will still fly a thermal camera, but you either have to add a second one to have daylight vision and RGB along with that. It depends upon what data you need. Uh, I know a lot of folks that fly the Inspire One with just strictly the thermal. Uh, especially uh, when you talk about fire departments, you know, popping that up, that bird, it's, it's quick, snap on four props and you're up in the air. You know, that, on first responder, it's a little bit different when you start talking about how quick do you need it out of the bag. You know, this you can carry in a backpack and you can have this bird up in the air with a, a really quick pre-flight uh, pre check. Running through all of that, you can have it up in the air in just a couple of minutes. Whereas doing one of these larger birds, you're talking about, you know, with this one, Depending on what you're doing with travel, it can take a full 25, 30 minutes to go through the full setup and then the whole pre-flight check to make sure that you know, you've got the batteries operable, the receivers are operable, based on how many cameras you've got. Uh, the, you know, the photographers in here know how, what it's like to balance a gimbal. You know, uh, that flies a roan in there. So you're talking about whatever additional time that that took before you did the setup and then trying to tune it while you're there on set or on site. <laughs> Uh, adds a different capacity to that. You know, when you talk about the operational setup, that comes down to, you know, if, if you're looking at first responders, it's how are you meshing into the incident command? Uh, you know, what information, what data do they need? Uh, if you're looking at, in CNN's world, uh, you know, how, how much live feed versus tape feed are you doing? We do, uh, it, you know, the feed the beast, they, we love live shots. Uh, anytime that they'll give me an opportunity to take a live shot, uh, there, there's a bit of work that goes into it, but we'll, we'll take the live shot, I would say, probably 45% of the time. If we, could, if we can get one, Almost if we have half, the opportunity, yeah. we're taking it. Um, there's a lot of inherent issues that arise with that, but uh, as far as going live, we have to think about a couple things. Weather is the immediate issue. Um, if it's you know, after a hurricane. Chances are good we're still going to have some residual gusts of wind that are going to come through. You know, you kick one up that's 50 knots, say goodbye to the, the bird. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it, those are the other aspects of it. You know, we're not flying, you know, the, the phantoms in, into, you know, if, if, if the eye of the hurricane is coming through, uh, chances are good I'll try and pop the Mavic up and see what I can see. But I'm not going to go and do that if I'm thinking I'm going to hit that eye wall and get it blown away. Yeah. You know, there's do you have a wind speed where you say absolutely? You yeah, fly yeah. Down. There's uh, twenty. We we like to stay below twenty knots if we can. Uh, that's it, it depends. And again, that comes into selection. If we know the weather's going to be bad, but we need to push the shot, we're going to use a, a heavier platform with a little bit more power to it. Uh, but then you know, then you're sacrificing battery life for. Yeah, it, it, there, there's just pros and cons to everything that you have to weigh. So if we're fighting a hurricane force wind. You know, we're going to need, uh, uh, obviously, the camera that's going to make it worth our while. We don't want to go up there and send you terrible footage. So we'll, we'll throw a 4K camera on there. If we're doing a live bump, then we're going to throw the biggest batteries that we can on there to make it last as long as we can. We're going to cut it down to the wire to make sure that, hey, we're going live. As soon as that drone's in the air, you guys might even catch the ascent. You know, we're, we're, we're not wasting time on, on trying to get in position and shoot. We don't have time to waste with the battery life. Um, however, we do have a tether system, which is... Uh, something that we've we've decided to introduce to the fleet um, that we can hook up to the new DJI equipment where we can actually have 200 feet of tether and flying definitely. Um, however, that's 
limits our ability to actually maneuver the aircraft. So, um, again, there's a lot of different selections that we can we at can that throw point at it becomes problem. a 200 foot tripod. Basically, yeah, yeah. So it's uh, we're again we're working on best ways to move things around, and we're we're in the infancy and in, uh, of these stages. But um, there's so when you're doing a live broadcast, uh, what? What equipment do you use outside of the bird, or is it just if it's 59.94? So the equipment list is, is, it took us a while to figure out what it is. Um, and I brought down the basic kit that we would go to use to go live. Um, we have our, basically, um, we need to be hooked up to a truck, a VGAN, uh, a live use source, something that can pump signal back to Atlanta or New York, wherever we need to get it to. Um, number two was DJI encodes their downlink signals. So to get image out of that to broadcast level, we actually had to strip the signal. Uh, we used a missing link uh, box that can actually strip the signal down and we can broadcast in 1080p, I, 720p, and I as well. So when you say that missing link, does that hook into what, the controller so and the we'll, receiver? So we'll use, yep, we'll use, uh, when I, we have the, the sentence controllers, the game has completely changed because everything's just outputted right from those controller DRC. Um, but we have to, if we were using the regular Inspire, we would use either the secondary or tertiary controller as the receiver, and then we would HDMI out of the receiver into the missing link box where it would then strip the signal and we can SDI it out of the missing link into the truck where they can then broadcast it to whoever, whoever needs it. So there's, there's a bit more than when we go broadcast, if you guys are looking to be in media or if you're looking to direct things back to the command center uh, in real time, there's, there's a couple more steps that are involved into it than just getting the image on your iPad or on your, 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 your tablet. Um, so broadcasting is a different animal when, when it comes to supplemental gear that you'll need to bring with you. Although there is a pretty slick setup where you, and I don't know if anybody has done this, where you can set up a YouTube, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and you could actually do a broadcast through there back to your incident command, or, you know, you can purchase several of these controllers, receivers, and you can actually have a, you know, a producer type setup for whoever needs to see the, the overall mm -hmm. shot of that. You can have somebody controlling the camera and then somebody controlling the bird on these matrices and even the inspires uh, so that they have separate setups that way. And it gives you an opportunity if you've got a, you know, if you're shooting with a DP or anything like that, uh, it gives you just another person that can have that visibility and that control of it. You know, so we talk about the operational environment, it comes down to, you know, are you shooting something live? Are you shooting a live event? Are you shooting sports? Uh, those type of things. And, you know, in a minute we'll get John to kind of talk about what they do when they're flying at a live event before they had the authorization for the flights over people and what they're doing now a little bit different uh, in that arena. You know, when you talk about the environment, uh, you know, you're talking about the wind. I can tell you, I don't, we, don't, we don't use a bird if the wind's over 20 miles an hour. Uh, just at that point, it just becomes so unstable. Uh, we don't have the same concessions maybe that the live TV audience, they're just looking for whatever that footage might be, even given the, the situation. So we, we won't fly anything over 20 miles an hour. Uh, when we talk about weather, uh, you know, of course, the 107 requires that you fly, uh, you know, 500 feet below the clouds. So you're talking about, uh, you've got to check whatever your cloud coverage is so that you know that you've got that opportunity. You can't fly through clouds because if you did that, you would lose the line of sight with the bird. You gotta be able to see this, the three miles uh, out in the distance. So those are all the operating environments that you take into uh, consideration. We don't fly any of our aircraft in uh, rain, uh, even if the uh, cloud coverage were to allow that. I know the Matrice, that 200 series changes that game. Yep, it's, uh, it's resistant. We'll say not it's, proof. It's not proof yeah. yet. Don't uh, put it in a lake. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll avoid the swimming lessons. But uh, yeah, we definitely push, um, at least for our purposes, CNN. We, there, there's been plenty of times where I've been out there in frog trogs flying in the rain. Um, not recommending it. Uh, you know, there's definitely a, a, a risk factor involved that we felt was necessary. And again, we weren't around anybody. It was mostly flood coverage. But uh, in order to get those shots, you know, we had to, we had to you know, push some boundaries of our equipment. Um, they survived, all of them. Uh, now we flew the Inspire 2 and the, and the Mavic, but those are you know, pretty well encased uh, by their shell, which we thought was our saving grace for the most part. I mean, we dried them out after a while and they, they went back up and flew, we tested them out, but there's, there's definitely the, the to, to our, our lady over here who was doing weather erosion or shore erosion, there's a lot of issues that come in with weather. I mean, if, are you gonna be by the ocean? So now you're talking about saltwater impacting your motor. 
Um, we're talking about coastal winds. If you're by a cliff, you're looking at wind shear coming off those. So there's a lot of different, a lot of different factors when you're trying to pick what, what kind of platform you would use for, for that. And you also want to have something that has the payload ability to carry a, a, a radar. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's really a necessity around your mission. And that's you know, what I, I, I want to stress is that everybody is in a different dynamic. So when, when you have to analyze those things, it's, it's, it's really about a user need, not so much a blanket. Did you self-insure? Will anyone insure you, or you just have to? We are. We got Ted Turner to insure us. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, he's not. Obviously, he's not long, no longer with the company. But um, we are very well insured. Uh, that's usually the the best way that we can open the door for a lot of folks, uh, especially universities. Um, we're trying to obviously get into the national park system, but that's you know we're chomping at the bit to get into there, but. Even with the insurances that we have, um, you know, we can get up to 10 million, 20 million, whatever the, the necessary. Nothing about loss of, of equipment. Oh, 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 not, not like a bodily not injury. <laughs> um, as, far, as, as far as coverage, yeah, we, we do fly with coverage. It just, uh, it, it's really just dependent on what we're flying. We're not going to really insure the snap here because it's, you know, we can get it for a couple hundred bucks. But uh, the, the Cadillac over there for 30 grand will probably throw a couple, couple, you know, binders on it and have it be insured. Um, but it, it, it's not mandatory for us. We got a blanket waiver that we have from the company. So if anything were to go wrong, we're, we're covered on that aspect as well. So we are insured to the teeth. <laughs> it's, it's good to have a name. It is. You know, I, when they told me I was speaking with CNN, I, do you remember the old telephone company commercial where the kids kept saying, you drive the truck? You drive the truck? Am I the only one that remembers that commercial? That's kind of how I felt, you know. Sit next to CNN. Who wants? It? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're not that bad. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, John, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Yeah. When you do your live shots, do you always have to be tied into a truck? Uh, uh, have you ever done a live shot using like a motor, a cradle motor, or something mm -hmm. like that? Yep. We use B GANs, and uh, we can also use uh, live views, which I actually have a live view in there as well. Um, but it's just a simple HDMI SDI out using cell cards. Um, we get them usually from Verizon or AT and T pretty soon, probably. Um, yep, they're they're not too bad. Um, as far as like, I'm, I'm waiting. Were you asking for like weight or carrying it around? They're pretty small. Is that uh, the, the cradle port motor, which uses all the different cards. Oh, 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 yeah. We we have those in there as well. Um, I usually don't. I'm not responsible for those. We have an engineer that usually, if I if it's beyond my skill tee, I'll have to I'll have to call in the engineers for them. But uh, that's usually a step above where it, it usually works most of the time. <laughs> so when, when you're shooting something in, uh, so when it runs, mm -hmm. credit. So you were talking about having two platforms where you have a person that's actually can take pictures. And what's the least expensive drone you can get into where you can have a pilot and another person operating the camera? Well, when you say the least expensive, you're talking about well, the, the it's, okay, so well, what, what he was asking, I don't know if everybody heard, I, I think he's got a pretty good voice. The, uh, what's the least expensive entry point cost-wise for a bird that you can have dual control, one for the camera, one for the uh, aircraft? Yeah, so the, the Inspire 1 offers that capability. And does the Mavic have that functionality now? Okay, so that, that Mavic is actually a pretty slick piece of equipment now. Uh, yeah, the sensor is a little bit small for some things uh, based on what you need, but it sounds like that's your, your avenue. Does that have an SD output? Uh, it does not yet, but on the uh, send into the crystal sky. Yeah, so explain that for just a second for those of us that don't know about what you're using for the output. And, and we're not sponsored by DJI. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, so the Sendence controller is basically just a souped up, it's the Ferrari of RCs that DJI is bringing out um, in, in conjunction with the, the Crystal Sky, which is basically uh, DJI's answer to iPads or tablets. It's its own self-contained unit that reduces glare, so anytime you're outside you're not looking through a, a, you know, a tent or trying to get anything, uh, any, any glaring and shots the out of the way. Too, right? Yes, the heat sensor was next on the list. They, yeah. uh, the overheating, I don't know if anybody has issues with CPU overloads with tablets or iPads, but uh, that's a big issue that I have in the field too, and I go through iPads pretty rapidly sometimes. But um, anyway, what that, what that system will allow you to do is actually self-contain any, any DJI product would be allowed to basically output a signal. Uh, so for your point, the, the Mavic was what we were actually testing yesterday was if we can go live with the Mavic using the Crystal Sky, which is the receiver and monitor, and it outputs HDMI or SDI. 
and that's kind of changes the broadcast game for us. Yes, ma'am. You said you go to our fast pretty regularly. What, what, what are you doing with that? I mean, we, we don't, it just overheats, so we just swap them out. Um, really? Yep, yeah, but again, you know, I'm in deserts, I'm in weird places yeah. sometimes. Even in the south, just on a warm day at 90 degrees, you'll yeah. find that the iPad, when you're flying for a half hour, an hour, just it'll, overheats. It'll get yeah, warm. No so when, when you shoot, I'm sorry, I'm mm -hmm. last question. Sorry, no, no, go ahead. When you, when you shoot uh, and you have a photographer and a drone operator, how does that, how are you credited? In other words, I've done things before, I've flown, and I've had a person, you know, looking and actually taking the picture. So who gets the credit for the photograph, you know? And we, we credited it for both of us because you had the pilot. What does CNN do? It just goes to CNN. <laughs> yeah, we don't. No, no, uh, no, you won't see my name on any of the. Uh, you know, any of the. You already signed that away. You don't see the drone operator. You might see CNN Air up in the corner, but you're not going to see you know John Rubenstall out there, or Greg Agvin, or Effie Needham. You know, we we kind of we we operate under the umbrella that you know CNN's the you know we, we that's our our bread and butter. They're our boss. That we feed the beast there. We don't. We're not looking for you know. Truthfully, we don't want to be on camera. We we don't even want our names on on TV. So it's, it's mission mission first. Yep, yep, mission first. We're we're we let Anderson Cooper and the rest of those guys take the credit for stuff. So we're we're not the basis. Doing, yeah, yeah, we're not we're not into that. He had his own the first. I'll come right around. We we do not use the goggles. We we play with them, um, but uh, as far as using them in an operational setting, it's it, the risk is too great for us. We need to have our our, our wits about us. We can't be blocking peripheral vision. Uh, oftentimes, we're in environments that aren't conducive. But that's what the pilots can do. Right. Uh, as far as far as the visual operator or the or the, or the photo yeah the photog can um, we we usually if if. Again, we're a small unit, but it, normally my counterpart, Effie, would, if he was operating the, the camera, we prefer to have him have his head outside of the goggles. Um, a monitor. It gives such a different perspective yeah, also. And, and it's also kind of, for us, it's greedy. Um, <laughs> when we're considered greedy if we're, if we're using the goggles because then our producer and the other folks can't see what we're seeing. Um, so a lot of our shots are, are pretty dynamic where they, they evolve as, as we see what, what the drone can see. Um, you know, when we're flying the border, you know, the, there might a, a producer might have a completely different idea of what he or she's thinking in their head, how the shot's going to look, and then it's, you know, when we get up in the air, they see something completely different. Um, but then to, you know, to kind of stay on point, it's, you know, it's mission specific. Uh, you know, wh how long can we be up there? What can we see? How fast can we go? What can we do in editing? Um, so most of the point, in, you know, at least staying kind of on topic, we... we, we Are you considered we, the director then? No, no, no. That's our. our no, but I'm just, but um, shots. It would be we're the we're the pilots in command. Uh, we try and accommodate as as best we can what the producer is looking to attain, but uh, the the end of the day at the end you know at the end of the day it's it's whatever Effie and I decide is is within our, our realm of responsibility. If we think it's a risky shot or we don't like the setup or we don't like the conditions, then we're not going to do it. And mm -hmm. that's that's kind of it. We got the full backing of our boss Greg Agvent, and you know. If, if you know anything, everybody gives us any kind of guff or whatever. Uh, you know, we have no issue stepping up to the plate as pilots to say that you know it's not a it's not a good look and we're not going to push it. Uh, there's tomorrow, sometimes. Uh, you know, if it's not a live shot, uh, there's sometimes tomorrow. But uh, for the most part, we don't uh, we don't let anybody tell us what to do. We're the bosses out there, and if we don't deem it not safe, we don't we don't do it. Yeah, and at it's, the end of the day, if something does take place. The pilot is the one that's accountable. Yeah, they the take FAA. my license. CNN's going to be okay. Uh, yeah, they'll, 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 they'll put, or jail time. Yeah, yeah. and Effie, he keeps mentioning Effie. Effie, Effie is a pilot our, in New yes, York. Yes, he is, our, he is our senior UAS operator in New York. He's uh, actually in Georgia today, but uh, he unfortunately had to go work. <laughs> I get to come play with you guys. So, um, but what was? You said that you were testing the Mavic yes. yesterday. Yes. Are you testing the new version that I just heard about for the Platinum? We, we don't have our hands on the Platinum yet. We're well, you were saying it was a little bit cheaper and it came with a lot more stuff. Yep, we, we're, we're looking into it, but for the our pro, pro, for right now the pros fit in the bill. The other question is, and cameras, how hard is it to replace a camera? Because it's all plastic, it breaks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they break, yeah. So, 
replacing parts on the Mavic or is how, how hard is that? Good, good question. Um, they're, it's a lot simpler than people think. Uh, as far as the, the, the larger ones, they just screw on and screw off uh, depending on how bad you, you might have damaged them. Um, let's assume you met a tree and the tree wasn't too nice to you and he snapped you, you know. Yeah. For the bigger guys, it's most of the time you can just take the, the, the gimbal off if it's that bad um, and replace the gimbal and the camera. Uh, sometimes it's a simple enough fix that uh, you can do it yourself. Oftentimes I suggest if people are going to do that, uh, don't fly commercially because if something were to, you know, if you, you know, grit spit and duct tape will get you a long way, but uh, when it, if it falls off and hits somebody, then you're in a world of hurt. So uh, if you can't do it yourself, I always recommend sending it back to the manufacturer. Um, for the most part, I've not had a bad experience whenever I've Regardless of what platform I'm using, customer service has been pretty pretty outstanding across all the boards so far. Between, you know, Parrot, uh, we do fly a couple of Parrots, the Bebops, the uh, DJI is great as well. Um, for the most part, Vantage Robotics is, I mean, they're great. But a lot of these companies are, you know, they're smaller fledgling startups. So that's the name of the game is to to make people happy at this point. Um, DJI is a bit of a different monster. Their secure their their support system's great. Uh, nine times out of ten, if I if I send a drone back that's you know hard broke, they're just going to send me a, a new one back, as opposed to trying to cannibalize something or replace it. But uh, when you do replace those parts, uh, keep in mind that you're going to have to if it's a part that's part of a flight function, if it's a motor, if it's a prop or whatever, obviously go out and test it. But uh, the the FAA has rules and regs about making your own additions to your manufacturer's platform. So keep and that in mind everything. too. Logging, of course. Yes, yes. Well, let's talk about contingencies and redundancy. And yeah, that'd be like great. That. Absolutely. You know, as, as we talk about the different birds and that, you know, you're you're looking at, you know, there's one controller, or one receiver, with this type of aircraft here, and then you know you start talking about the matrices, and that's that's one of the advantages there is they give you a little bit more of a uh, uh, industrial application, real good fit there. On the 210, does it have three controllers built into that? I see, I see the one GPS. We can, we can use three. Um, we're still waiting on the other two centers controllers. They should be. Uh, okay. So, gotcha. We just got this at the beginning of the week, so we're we're just kind of still unboxing it, if you will. Um, we we've flown them a couple times before, but this is actually Effie's. It's going up to New York, so. We're borrowing it for the week, and it all souped up, and then sad goodbye. Yeah, it's, yeah. don't name them. <laughs> if if you look at like the Matrice 600, the Pro there, one of the advantages of that bird is it's got three of the A3 controllers, the DJI controllers, and what that means, uh, you probably heard about these flyaway aircrafts, um, you know, where you lost link and it never came home. You know, all these stories where somebody opened it on a Christmas or birthday, they go out, they fly it that one time, and they never see it again. And those, fortunately, the technology has improved, uh, you know, exponentially since a lot of those. And with that bird, what it's designed is, it's also designed for doing uh, cell tower inspections, power line inspections. And so it's got that triple redundancy so that if one controller, it's, it's constantly moving between them. You can see the lights. Uh, flashing between them, trying to make sure it's got the clearest channel. You know, because when you start talking about that, uh, what is it, 2.4 and 5.8, you know, it's an open channel uh, of frequency, so you've got everything operating on there, uh, cell phones included, things like that. And so it'll switch between those to make sure that it's always got a good connection. And then, you know, when you talk about the props, it's got the six props. Uh, if it has a failure of one of the engines, it'll still fly so that you can safely land it. It takes six batteries, so if one of the batteries fails, it still has a fail-safe where it'll be able to land safely uh, to be able to do that. Question about that. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, one motor fails, but this battery's still good, is the circuitry interconnected so that then, but then, then if you coincidentally have an opposite battery fail, are you just operating on four props then, or can it still, would the other five props use all you have? Yeah, so his, his question was, and I've got to tell you, I've not, I've not experimented with this. You know, if somebody else had the bird and wanted me to try it out, I'd be glad to do it for them. <laughs> but he was talking about if one of the batteries failed and then one on the opposite side failed. I, I know the data that DJI publishes uh, only specifies that if one battery fails, then it could, it could recover from that, uh, and then one prop. 
Uh, I've not tested it myself. I have tested, you know, the Lost Link and those those type of technologies, just as part of our operating manuals uh, in that procedure in that regard. If you do it, you should put a video out there for us. Yeah. That, that's a great question, and I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through a couple platforms to give you a sense of price range, capability, so that you can see those firsthand, and then we can talk about some of the options and, you know, the different payloads that they can carry. I know you had a question. Yeah, um, well, two, two now. One is, how far are you traveling when you're testing um, at the, the 600, and how is, you know, factoring that into your pricing? I mean, for Tina, it's a different issue for yep, yep. the, the whole different mantra. But you know, as, a, as an individual operator, how, how does that work for a smaller company? How does that, how do you, how does that work? So she was asking, how do you price in and compensate for the cost of transportation, for travel, things like that? And that's, that's a valid question, right? Um, you know, what, what also comes into play is the insurance levels. Right. You know, it's a very different, uh, for that bird there, we, in our uh, operating manual, you know, we've got at least, someone has to have at least 50 hours of flight time before they can even touch the bird. To be able to fly it uh, for a project and things like that, you got to, and 50 hours on any, on any platform, doing it professionally. On this one, 25 hours on that bird before you can go out and actually fly it out in a public setting or anything like that is generally what the, uh, the our insurance carrier requires for that. Uh, when you start talking about cost, and this is coming from uh, the individual that's going to be leading the panel tomorrow on starting and running your own drone business. Uh, and, you know, so as you look at pricing that in, I've got to tell you, I don't, I don't go on an aircraft. That, that thing doesn't, doesn't go on an aircraft with me. There are folks in the studio world out in the West Coast that will fly with these all the time. Uh, and there's other birds that are that size. Mike Fortin and Center Drones and those guys are flying with this stuff all the time. Uh, on this one, though, it's always by auto, uh, and it's really in the southeast, you know, so you're right, that is factored in. We just did a shoot for, uh, well, it was for one of the universities for the ESPN slot, but I got to tell you, you want to know what the media company wanted us to use? The Phantom 4 Pro. That's what we used. Now, with this, I travel with triple redundancy. We've got three of these birds. So that if we, you know, whatever you run into, you run into all of a sudden it won't read an SD card. You run into a, mag, a, a compass error, and you can't fix that straight away. Firmware update. Yeah, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, so that, that way we've got that redundancy. And, and so that has to be built into that cost model. Uh, you know, so those are all good, valid points. So the shooting 4K, is, is 4K, 4K, 4K? Does, does it not matter the platform is still equal quality 4K, or do you have variability within the 4K world? Yeah, there's, Sensor there's, size, yeah. right? Yeah. The depth and then, you know, the f-stop. You know what? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, no, it was. I mean, we most of the time the only thing that we're ever worried about, um, as far as 4K goes, is there's two things: a, we don't broadcast in 4K, and b, we don't store in 4K. Yeah. So you're happy at 1080. We're happy at 1080. Um, it's it seems to be working so far, but uh, we we shoot everything in 4K. Um, storage is the issue because uh, we know 4K is going to be the future. If, if you know some places already have 5K. So uh, when we select that, it's mostly the frame rate that we're worried about, not so much the resolution that we're shooting in, just because if we're on a different frame rate, it'll look choppy or like strobe, the strobe effect where, you know, uh, we usually like to be in 30 frames, 30 to six, you know, 4K by 30 if we're shooting 4K. 60 just seems to be overkill unless we're doing something for doc, a doc unit um, or sports. Sports is really into the 4K by 60 just because instant replay is a big deal. So. But again, we're we're with the drones, so we're not. That's you're that's, not on the goal yeah, line. Yeah, right. We're not we're not over the field or anything like that. Well, but you're actually, you're actually talking two different windows. One in video, and one would be for stills. For stills. Right. So the 4K would be great for stills, but it's not that good for the other. Right. You can't shoot 4K stills. It's just a, whatever the resolution is of the sensor that's running yeah. 4K. It's just whatever. Right. Yeah, I I think. A great point that he made, for most practical purposes, 1080 uh, is, is acceptable for that. What CNN's doing is they're sort of future-proofing so that they can have their vault of videos already in the 4K uh, at that point in time. You know, you start looking at iPads, uh, what do they operate at, 480? 
Uh, you know, it's pretty dialed down stuff, so it, it just depends upon the project that you're using uh, in that regard. We'll take one more and then we'll kind of talk through some of the platforms. Go ahead. I don't know if this would actually apply, but are y'all seeing different trends in terms of, uh, I guess, the news networks that are mostly focused on getting high quality videos? Are they going with a certain set of drones or quality type drones? And then, I guess, newspaper or whoever would be shooting in print, are they going with another type of uh, drone to get more of the uh, sharper still images? You brought up earlier the difference between video quality and picture quality. I mean, mostly for us, we're we're just using 4K. If we if we're if we can get away using the the Mavic, we're gonna we're gonna do that. Um, as far as picture quality, um, truthfully, I haven't really given much thought to, to what really Prince doing. Much, doing. Yeah, um, I, I haven't done as far as photos. You know, the only time we'll do that is we'll actually pull something out of 4K if we're gonna put it on Twitter or uh, if we're if we're you know using it for the social media platforms. Um, we'll just actually pull it right out of the right out of the video and use it as a as a JPEG, but um, you know that seems to work out pretty well. Uh, again, it depends on what size you're looking at. If if we're going to be looking on a cell phone screen or if we're going to be looking on a you know a laptop, so there's different, I guess different uh, different sizes that we're looking at. Um, those are decisions that are made at a at a different level than me. Um, but as far as to answer your question, if if you're shooting 4K out of the video, you should be able to pull out a, a, a photo just fine. Um, I don't think anybody has any real preference. I know DJI is uh, the leader in, in the industry right now as far as platforms to use. Uh, we certainly sing their praises, but you know, there's other guys out there that can do just as, as equal as a job. Where that might come into more play is if uh, you see that more frequently would be with Zoom. If you've got anything shooting in with a Zoom camera, uh, the video on it usually is pretty, uh, you know, what do you say, the jello effect, it's pretty, pretty garbly, uh, real grainy, anything that you're shooting with that, whereas you could pull a, a decent still out of those, uh, so depending upon who's shooting it and who needs it for what application. Most folks are trying to find one bird that will fit that scenario, uh, what they're looking for, and so as we, as we talk through, we can kind of give you a little sense of, of you know, what you're looking at. You know, I, I brought this little one. This is this is my granddaughter's toy. So you know, I I do drones for a living. So at four years old, I, I thought it's a great time. And you know, I, I read a stat that said I think it was only four percent of the 107 certificates are female. And I thought how how surprising, how disappointing. So I want to add my granddaughter to that uh, to that field. But you know, when you talk about ease of operation, it comes with a little control. It runs around the hundred dollar price range. This Mambo does. But if you're looking to get into learning how to fly drones, look for the ones that have a hovering feature, okay? Whether they're using a barometer, whether, you know, GPS is gonna be much more pricey uh, when you get into that price range. But look for that, and that way it'll hold the altitude because when you get down in that $40, $50 range, $70 range, you know, you're, you're trying to fight that end of it. You can't really figure out how to fly the bird. Um, you know, and although there are some guys that have done that very, very well, and. and you know, they're great drone racers or great uh, video takers in that. So that would re really be at the bottom end of things. Uh, the DJI Spark, at, you know, it runs just that $500 price range, just under there. Uh, I know a lot of folks that will shoot with that. It's got a really small sensor, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of field depth uh, when you're shooting with it. But it, I know guys that are great with the editing tools, and so they're really able to turn that into some good pictures. Uh, the, the film is good for shooting, uh, you know, something close up if you're doing real estate videos or photos. Uh, but once you get a, a distance of beyond two, 250 feet, uh, it becomes really challenging to get the quality that you might want on that. And that's when it steps you up into the Mavic range. Yep. And uh, the Mavic is really our, I, I want to call it the workhorse, but uh, it's, it's proven itself to become that. Um, I take it with me everywhere I go, even when, you know, just PTO, it stays in the truck with me, wherever I'm at, it's always on me. Um, for the exact purpose of it's so easy to bring. Uh, it probably weighs less than five pounds. I got three or four batteries I, I bring with me, shoots 4K, has all the tech that you can want. Um, as far as if, you, you know, if you're looking at an entry market, that's, that's it right there. It's, Is that what's in the bag? Yep, it's, uh, it's the Fomatic. 
This is this is it. Just I think that's a pro kit. Yep, this right, is the where it comes with the bag and the extra batteries. Yep, and it's I mean it's super simple for cost of entry. I think it ran like twelve hundred bucks. So if you're looking to get into the into the, the world of you know compact, that's it. And it's pretty much out of the box ready to go. Uh, powered up, get your you know, obviously go through the you know your checklist and that's it, you're ready to fly for the most part. It's um, Something that we can we can travel with easily. We don't have to break it down when we're when we're quick and we're moving different sites. Um, same thing can be said for the P4. It's it's, it's pretty similar as far as technology and, and um, endurance goes. Uh, the other thing about that is it can stay up in the air if we're not fighting anything for about 20 minutes. Um, you know we're we're pushing it. I usually like to set my you know this is just my personal preference. But once you know we get to about 35 percent, I start letting the buzzers go off to remind me to come back. But it, if we're not fighting wind, if we're not fighting elements, if we're not doing a lot of movement, this little guy will do everything that you want. It'll be up in the air for 15, 20 minutes easy. Um, How it, far can you see that one versus, <laughs> you know, the, so that's, you've got to maintain line of sight with the bird. And, you know, the smaller the aircraft, the further away, the yeah, harder it is. What do you is. find with um, that? Because, you know, a larger bird, you know, although you wouldn't fly that one probably 2,500 feet away, you'd, you'd easily see it at that distance on a, on a clear day. You know, the Phantom 4, you can pick that one up pretty well, up to about 2,500 feet. We actually, we actually have different ways to identify it. So we can attach strobe lights. We'll put uh, high-end reflective tape on them. Uh, that helps for the visual line of sight. I mean, it's, these things will go. Um, to be quite honest with you, the furthest I've flown it was uh, 10,000 feet away uh, and still kept the video down like on it. Now, that was... Obviously, we were out in the middle of nowhere in the desert, and we were just pushing just to push to see how far we could get away with it, see what the box was actually, the numbers were on it were accurate. I mean, and it performed perfectly. Um, so as far as, you know, giving a recommendation for if you're trying to start out and get into the entry level, this guy has it all. Um, but to, to, to your point, getting into the more professional side of things, if we're looking to do uh, bigger, batter, you know, we're looking at the Inspire. Uh, the Inspire 2 is the one that will, will be the next level up. Those are our, uh, the Inspire usually goes with me on every shoot. Uh, well, it was the Inspire 1 just because we always have, we always have to have the ability to go live. Um, now that we're discovering that the Mavic has those output abilities, things might change, but um, I know the general plan, and I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't think this is a secret, we, ideally it would make sense for us to have as many of these cameras out there as possible. Um, so the, the initial plan in the future is to get most of our photojournalist teams and, and our reporters, we want them to have a Mavic with them everywhere they go to. Um, obviously safety is the concern, we want them to be 107, they have to be 107. Um, we're having issues where, you know, most of the pilots, you know, I'm a private pilot, Effie, my counterpart in New York's a private pilot. Uh, CNN requires you to have those, those capabilities just because they want you to, you know, it's, it's, they want you to know what, what you're doing. Uh, a lot of the photojournalists don't want to take the time to go get their, their PPL or any of their sports certificates. And not saying that they don't want to do it, just that they're busy and they don't have the time. So if we can get something that's ease of use, out of the box, ready to go, that doesn't take a whole lot of studying, you don't need a degree to operate it, uh, it seems like it, you know, if, if and I, you know, I don't want to say this out loud, but if I can do it, truthfully, like a, a six-year-old, anybody can do it. It's, truthfully, it's the simplest piece of, equipment that I've operated since I've been flying them uh, as far as user user friendliness goes, which is the really the part that we're, we're looking at. You want to talk about uh, that? Yes, we have, we actually have prop cages. Um, so terminology is a little bit different, but the prop guards are um, the actual bar that you saw that goes around here. Now a prop cage will actually encompass the whole, the whole motor itself and cage in the entire prop from the, the top to the side to the bottom. Um, it's, uh, it becomes a little lunky when you do that. There's settings that you'll have to address when you go into the, in, in the fly it. But um, as far as liability is concerned, which is all, you know, safety and liabilities are no, you know, pretty much at the forefront of every thought that we have. Um, it's definitely helped negate the risk that we have when we, when we need to prove a case to the FAA. We're starting with the, the snap here, but we're, you know, we're pushing for the Mavic next. Uh, I don't know if that's gonna be two years in the making or how long that process is gonna be. But, um, you know, for, for prop cages, we definitely like them. They, they, make, uh, they make things a little bit louder, a little bit lunky, uh, and they definitely, added weight means that you're gonna have less time in the air. Um, lift equals weight, thrust equals drag. So the more things you put on there, 
the, uh, the more issues you're going to have as far as time goes. Um, you know, other than that, the, the, the cages for the big guys haven't come out yet, so we're, we're still waiting on those. But So you're talking about a price point of just over $1,000 for the Mavic. When you move into the Phantom 4, uh, the Pro, you're talking about roughly $1,400. I know the I think they just went through a price drop, I heard, this week. I haven't, I haven't bought one this week. Uh, but you're talking about something that shoots in 4K, uh, 20 meg uh, for still, and it's got a one-inch sensor. So for an all-purpose aircraft, it's, it's really a, a brilliant device. Uh, there's, you know, when you start talking about batteries, you know, that's a cost consideration. Uh, for the Phantom line, it runs in that 150, 160 per battery. Uh, that's one arena that I would encourage you to stick with, uh, making sure you go with a genuine a manufacturer's product is on the batteries because the ones that have had the problems have been the ones that have been shipped that were not uh, the original manufacturer's label. Uh, there's a lot of problems with those when people were charging them. Most of those have gone away now with the, the smart <coughs> chips that are put into these things uh, when you're looking at that. You know, when you step up from this, the Inspire 1 still has a lot of application. Uh, it really on the, uh, you know, when you think about uh, the thermal side of it, it's got a lot of thermal cameras that have not been developed yet for the Inspire 2, so it's a good platform there. You're talking about an entry point, not the Inspire 1, but the Inspire 1 Pro. Uh, you want to, the differentiation there is the flight stability. They changed the props. They changed a few things within uh, the way the controller operates on the actual bird itself. So it's a much more stable bird than just the, uh, the regular Inspire 1. The Pro uh, can handle um, you know, what they call the X5 camera. So it's got a 20 meg camera, shoots in 4K. It's a micro four thirds lens uh, that comes on that. The kit now, it's come down, I mean, it's almost half price of what it was just a year and a half ago. I think it's in the, right around the $3,000 range. You might find something 100 bucks one way or the other. Uh, and the battery consideration, uh, you know, it comes with one battery. The other ones run about 150 to 160 on those in that price range. You'll find some deals here and there, different holidays where you can do a little bit better. From there, you jump right into What's in the case? Well, this, that uh, that's the tether. That's the uh, tether. But I have the Inspire 2 over yeah. there as well. I just haven't popped it up and out of there. But that would be my next yeah. suggestion would be the Inspire 2. Um, and the, the main difference between the 1 and the 2 off the top of my head would be battery life. Um, we get it's a, it's a dual system on the Inspire 2. Uh, obviously, you're going to probably pay a little bit more, which could probably be uh, one of the reasons why the Inspire 1 kit is come down a, a little bit there, but uh, the two is definitely just as capable. Uh, obviously, it's more capable than the one, but um, as far as opening price point, that you're going to pay a little bit more for the two, uh, but with that, you're going to get more sensors than the one. You're going to get longer endurance. You're going to get uh, a couple more camera options. They're actually, they have a... a, a oh, that new 7? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's have you seen the X7 that just came out uh, the week before last? Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to see some of the, the field test on that thing. So are we. And the features have they added collision sensors? Or the, they just have them because yeah, they, they do. So that's a great point, right? You know, when you're looking at the Phantom 4, you've got, you know, these different sensors where it'll help protect the vehicle uh, from the front, the back, and then yeah, also coming down uh, so that if you, you can change the settings on that to I think as close as about 15 feet, if you know, a tree, a wall, whatever it might be, uh, so that it'll actually stop and hold the vehicle there. Or uh, on some of the softwares, you can actually program it so that it'll, it'll avoid that. That's one of the big changes on the Inspire 2 versus the Inspire 1, and that's, that's a big differentiator there. Smart return to home as opposed to not so smart return to yeah, home. Yeah, you know, on the older versions, the smart, uh, I mean, the return to home would return at whatever altitude it was at, whereas now you can actually program the altitude to make sure you lift above trees, buildings, wires, whatever might be there. Uh, so that's a, a big difference maker there. Uh, the uh, Inspire 2, of course, has got a, a peppier performance. I think uh, it was dialed in, it's, it originally was 62 miles an hour, and then they dialed that thing back to the high 50s, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's real important on the video side of this is the speed that the Inspire records at, it records, the Inspire 2 records at 100, uh, versus you go back to the old Inspire and it's uh, 50. 
I think is the spec on that one. So your record rate is a little bit faster on it, uh, the speed that it can write at. You know, it records the Inspire 2 records to the SSD uh, versus the SDI, you know, the mini cards. Uh, so that's a cost difference there. Those run about $100 a piece, I think. And then you need the software uh, yeah. to, to The edit. license to be yeah. able to uh, manipulate and edit the software, which runs, I think, about 1000 to $1,400 a user per year. Mm -hmm. So that's a cost consideration on the Inspire 2. Uh, and then, you know, when you move up from there, you're, you're talking about, you know, the Matrice 600, there's really two key uses for that in my world. One would be for the telecom inspections. You know, we could put a Z30, the DJI Z30 zoom lens. You know, it's got a 30 optical and a six digital, so it's 180 times zoom. So that if you're inspecting a tower or power lines, you don't have to be right up on it. You can, you can really pick that up from a distance. And then the ability to fight the magnetic waves and manage through that, it's, it's a big safety feature that the uh, power companies require. Uh, you know, post hurricane recovery and that, it's a very popular vehicle uh, for them to bring on as, you know, a contractor during that time to inspect that equipment. And that's, that's what we work with. The other part of it is the being able to carry a Ronin, uh, the gimbal, so that you can carry, whether it's a 35 millimeter, you can uh, put a small cinematic camera on there. You're talking about the bird alone with one set of batteries is in the $5,000 range now. It's about 4,900, I think is the latest price I heard. I mean, that dropped about $4,000 over the last couple of years. Uh, you're talking about on the battery side, they'll require six of those. So you're talking about buying a set, I, I think it runs in the $900 range for the set, uh, to be able to have one set. If you're flying <coughs> the zoom lens, you're talking about getting roughly a half hour flight time. If you're flying a 35 millimeter, I fly a, a Sony A7R2 because of the lightweight, uh, you know, the mirrorless there that the weight really works well on that. You're talking about a flight time of about 14 minutes uh, is what you get with that. So those are the, the considerations. You know, when you talk about adding the Ronin to it, that's roughly another $3,000. And then if you're looking at, uh, you know, the remote start stop, you're looking at the focus so that you can, you know, if you want to rack the focus or pull the focus while you're shooting with that, uh, you're talking about another $2,000 to be able to do that. It doesn't have the vision sensors like the other aircrafts. You can add that, uh, you know, and you know, some guys, I, I don't fly with those and most of the stuff because uh, just you're, sometimes you're really close to whatever you're filming. Uh, you can't get close enough to a tower if you're filming that. If you're near a building, it interferes and it'll stop the progress of the bird uh, to be able to do that. Why don't we uh, open it up for what, one more question if we've got anything. If, if you want, John and I are available. Yeah, we're here. Uh, and, you know, we'll, I'll be here the rest of the day, too. Sure. Uh, I'm in education. Our, the route we've mostly gone is with just a flight control board. Okay. So I wonder if you had any suggestions or comments about just flight control boards that have, like, open source software and are affordable and durable. Yeah, so you're doing it for research purposes, too? Are you on the yeah. engine? Are you doing it for? It's a, a steam program that I have. And we've actually built. That's not my spectrum of expertise. I'll, I'll certainly uh, hand that one over. I don't know how much building you've yeah, done I, with I, those. I'm, I'm not more I'm into, not an engineer. In the, into the, I know enough to know that I don't know enough, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, uh, I've dabbled with them, but uh, to the extent where you know you want to use it as a lesson plan, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable <laughs> I saw giving a recommendation. there were some folks in the sensor meeting that might be worth you looking at some of those speakers and asking them. Well, thanks for uh, attending the session. Yeah, guys. We'll be around. Thank you.